Uh, okay, so now let's look at, at a problem involving segment trees. You know, so this problem is like not the easiest problem. And we will see some like also nice parallels between basically divide and conquer algorithms, parallel algorithms, and the segment tree algorithms. So it turns out what it takes to solve a problem efficiently with parallelism, as well as using a divide and conquer approach, as well as with a segment tree are kind of one and the same. So before we kind of go into this, let's just kind of look at like what are the limits of what a segment tree can do. Because in this next problem, we won't be do dealing with addition. Uh, so what operations can actually be supported in the segment tree? So the answer is you have to have some kind of like, you know, operation that combines two elements and produces a value. And it also has to be what's called associative. Uh, associative is basically a mathematical property, meaning that if you have, for example, elements A, B, and C, okay, and now I'm using kind of like this sort of like abstract math notation where dot, dot is just like an arbitrary operator. Like, don't think of it as multiplication. Multiplication is certainly an example of such an operator that it can be, but really dot is abstract. It's like, it, can, it can mean plus, it can mean times, it can, be, it can be division, it can be max. It's just some like, it's just a placeholder for like an abstract operation. It, and specifically, it's an operation on, of two ele on two elements that outputs an element of the same type. So basically, dot is basically just some function on, on a tuple t, t, and that produces a type t. So like, this is some type. Like, it could be a number, it could be a matrix, it could be whatever. Like, uh, it's, a, it's a binary operation on elements of a particular type that produces another element of that same type as, as the answer. The importance of producing an element of the same type is, of course, that you can keep combining elements using the same operation. Um, so certainly, like, having the type be real numbers and having the operation be addition is one option, but it can be like matrices and the operation can be matrix multiplication, or it can be some like really weird data structure, it can be the type that somehow is, can be combined by some other operation with another data structure just like it. Like for example, uh, list concatenation would be another example. Like concatenate two lists. Like the, 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 in this case, the type is the list and the operation produces another list from two lists list concatenation. Uh, that could be, like A, B, and C could be lists here, and we, we could be talking about concatenation. So it's very abstract. But like, I'm, I'm showing it kind of abstractly like this, so you can understand what like the sort of theoretical limits of the segment tree are. So we say that a type is associative uh, if like this property is true, for whatever the type is and whatever the, whatever the operation is. Like, then, then we say like this is associative for this operation for this type. Um, it basically means that like regrouping the elements in a different order doesn't matter. Um, note that like associativity is actually not necessarily the same as commutativity. Commutativity is this. Ne neither one actually like necessarily implies the other. Uh, you can have examples that, like yeah, like neither one implies the other. Uh, and this property is far less common than this property. Like most things have this property. It's actually kind of hard to come up with an example of something that doesn't have this property. Basically, if you just regroup the parens in a different way, you don't get the same answer. Even if you like don't invert the order of operations. It's pretty easy to come up with examples of things that don't have this property. Like uh, for example, matrix multiplication doesn't have that property. And if you don't have any intuition for what matrix multiplication is, uh, think of it this way, like, uh, uh, among other things, a matrix operation can encode uh, geometric transformations such as, like, a rotation. So think about it like, okay, if you rotate something about the x-axis and then you rotate something about the y-axis, is it the same as if you first rotate about the y-axis and then rotate about the x-axis? If you try this out, you can see that no. Like, like the, the order in which you rotate matters, for example, for rotations. So, um, you know, if A and B are like these kind of like abstract objects that represent rotations, then the effect of applying B first and then A is not the same as applying B and then, you know, you, you, you can kind of come up with examples like that. Or even, uh, I guess a super easy example is like subtraction. 
like 3 minus 7 is not the same as 7 minus 3. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess subtraction is like, yeah, I guess subtraction is an ex technically an example of something that is like not associative, right? Because if you have, if you have this, it's not the same as this, right? So, yeah, because this is like, like see, like this is like minus six, but, th but this one would actually be uh, four, right? So very different. Uh, so subtraction is not even associative. But of course, you know, if we ever have to do subtraction in segment trees, we'll of course just deal with negative numbers and deal with addition, which has all of these properties. So, yeah, I mean, subtraction isn't usually used as an example of these things, but uh, I guess you could see it that way. So why does a segment tree require this like associative property? Well, it's because you have to think like how a segment tree does its work, right? So um, remember that like in a segment tree, basically what will happen is we will have like some array of elements, and we will basically have like some higher array that basically kind of summarizes it effectively, right? So like yeah, we basically have this like summary array that is half the size. And the way we evaluate a query, right, is if we have, you know, if for example we want to do some operation on, say, like these elements, this range, we will basically take, uh, like, so let's say this is, um, you know, array A, and so this is like, uh, the indices here are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Effectively, what we want for like some operation dot, right, whether it's max or plus or whatever else, right, we basically want to compute this, right? You know, we, we want to compute this, like dot a4, dot a5, dot a6. That's actually what we want. Um, and the way the segment tree proposes to do this work for you is it says, okay, regroup the elements a bit. Uh, regroup it like this, regroup it into a1 times a6. Well, you don't have to reverse the order technically, but it, it, the segment tree pr proposes that you regroup it kind of like so that you re-parenthesize this expression like so, right? Um, and it's because this part is amenable to optimization. So it's basically saying, okay, uh, take this piece, then do the calculation uh, you know, on these elements at this higher level, and here it would propose that you would regroup these elements like so, because this element, like this A2 times A3, is what is in here. Right? This is a2 dot a3. And this is a4 dot a5. So a segment tree would basically propose you kind of re-parenthesize the expression as follows. Right? That you first, you know, first you isolate like the part that's going to go to the next level, and then you're going to evaluate this, and then you're going to evaluate that. So, you're, so a segment tree is kind of regrouping the order uh, not, not like order like A times B or B times A necessarily, if, with careful implementation. Um, in the example I showed earlier with addition, we were kind of like regrouping it as like A1 plus A6 and then promoting it to the next level. But with careful implementation, you, don't, you can actually preserve the order. You can make it so that you never like do B times A instead of A times B. With, with a careful implementation, you can make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, but... Uh, you, you do have to re-parenthesize the expression because if you can't, if you, if you can't do this, then the segment tree idea doesn't work because you can't isolate this like middle segment and like evaluate it separately from the rest of this. Like if what you really wanted is you wanted it to do it like in a specific order, like you will start with A1 and then you will combine it with A2 and then you will combine it with A3 and then you will combine it with A4. And if you can't regroup this, in any way without changing the answer, then, this doesn't, then, then the segment tree doesn't work because the segment tree must regroup the elements. It must kind of fetch these pre-computed blocks of A2, uh, of like A2, A3, A4, A5. It must kind of like fetch these pre-computed segments of the array, otherwise it won't be able to be efficient. The only way to do this is by, you know, doing it one element at a time. If you must avoid any kind of like regrouping of the parentheses. The whole point of the segment tree is to store pre-computed segments that can be easily combined 
with the other values. So we do need an operation that's associative. But everything else, um, you know, it can be like operating on any type as long as it's associative. And it do technically doesn't even have to be commutative. It doesn't have to be that like A times B is the same as B times A. And it's not really times, it's like any operation. It can be max, it can be whatever. But another kind of important aspect here is that you have to understand that like whatever operation you choose, it has to be one where you can actually calculate the answer from the, from the arguments. It has to be that the answer for combining A and B can actually be calculated from A and B. And you might say, well, how would that not be the case? Well, let me show you. Uh, so let's consider a nice problem here. This is, a, I think, a very nice problem uh, to solve you know, with segment trees. Uh, the basic, so this is based off of like a basic problem you probably all know. And the basic problem is uh, maximum sum subarray, uh, maximum contiguous sum subarray. So uh, you, know, you know this classic interview question where you have an array and it contains positive and negative numbers. For example, and you have to find the contiguous subarray with the maximum sum. So in this case, um, in, in this case, the answer is uh, you would want to find this subarray. But it can be anywhere in the array. Like it can have any start index i and any end index j that is after. So let's consider this problem. So first of all, what is the classic solution to this? The classic solution is that essentially you will build some kind of additional, well, you, 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 like when you get down to the final solution, you can actually eliminate a lot of this and make it even simpler. But kind of the conceptually easiest thing to understand here that can, can just lead you to understand the solution in a minute is we're going to make an additional array B. And basically B of I is going to contain the best subarray that ends at B of I. And then we'll just take the best of all of those. We'll just scan the array and take the best value. It turns out you don't actually need the array. You can just kind of hold on to the best value you've seen so far. But to kind of simplify it, we'll just do it this way. That we're going to make an array B. And, and basically, B of I is just the best subarray ending at index I. So basically, at every value, so like first it's 10. And then what is the best subarray ending at index negative 5? Or and ending at index 1, which is like this index. Right? Uh, so, so basically, we have two choices. Choice number one is we take the current value, and then we're allowed to add on the best subarray that ended at the previous index. Right? So basically, the best subarray that ends at this index is you can either take zero, you like say, I don't want anything in the subarray, or you can say, I'm going to take this value, and then that unlocks the option to take you know, because now, you know, because now you've taken this value, so you're allowed to connect to what's over here, and you can take the best subarray that ends at this value, because why would you take any other one? Uh, so, so now uh, we say, okay, what is the best value here? We can pick between two choices. We can pick between zero or negative five and the answer here. So here we get uh, five. And here we can pick between zero and negative six plus five. Uh, so negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1, so 0 is actually better. So the best subarray ending at negative 6 is 0. Just don't take anything. There's nothing good you can take. I'm allowing like arrays of length 0. We can modify this approach a little bit if that's not allowed. Um, then how about um, 13? Well, 13, and then take the best subarray. Oh, wait, it's better not to take anything. Uh, so just 13. And then 2, two uh, you can take 2 and then... You can either take 2 plus 13 or you can take 0. That's obviously better to take 15. And then here you can take 0 or you can take negative 1 plus 15, so 14. And then here you can take 0 or take 7 plus 14, 21. And so, and now you just scan this array and find the best value. This is the best value. So it, it's best to take a subarray that ends here. And if we stored some additional indices, we could also have recovered like where this array started. Or we could do like a separate step for it. Uh, but see, this array of size 20, of sum 21, it's this subarray, 13, 15, 14, 21, it's the best one, right? 
So this is the solution. And here we've determined that the best value is 21, and it ends at this index. OK, so that's pretty good. Um, that's like a good like sequential classical algorithm. So now, um, here I'm going to ask the dynamic version of this problem. So the dynamic version of this problem is as follows. Um, given the initial array, you get to pre-process it in some way. And then there will be interleaved updates to the elements, with interleaved with queries of what is the best solution right now. So basically, this array will be like dynamically updated on the fly. Like there will be update, there will be like an API where like update is called, it takes an index and a value and sets the value of that value. Um, and like, like for example, you will say update index three to be 20. And then I, I will expect, you know, like to dynamically on the fly, like update my solution of what is the best answer right now. Uh, and it should work better than linear time. I shouldn't have to recompute the whole answer just because I changed one value. I should, I should somehow do this in a way that, for example, I mean, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but maybe like both operations will run in logarithmic time. Like maybe updating something will take logarithmic time and uh, also it will take logarithmic time to query what is the best value. Or maybe it will even take constant time or something. But the point is, we don't want to have to recompute the whole answer every time an element changes. So that seems really tricky, right? Because like, how do you how do you get this done? I mean, after all, like, it really seems like this algorithm is very like sequential, right? Like, if any one value changes, it's going to be like completely different, right? I mean, because every value depends on every previous value. So it's kind of like the same problem we had originally when we started, right? Uh, when we saw that like cumulative array trick. Uh, you know, we also saw this like really efficient way to, you know, get the sum of a range, but if you change one value, everything changes. So we need to kind of in the same way sort of avoid uh, a situation where changing one thing changes everything else. So that we, when, when something changes, we only recompute a limited number of values. And that was the whole secret behind the efficiency of the segment tree, right? When one value changed in the sum, we only had to go up the tree to do the update, right? Like in the segment tree, um, oh, I guess technically I didn't say how to do the update in the segment tree, but because we did it for the block structure, I guess I, I, guess I kind of assumed it's, it, it, it's obvious, right? Like, I mean, every node holds the sum of all the nodes below it. So for example, if you update this node, then the update just propagates up to here, and then it propagates over here. So for example, if you increase this value by five, then you go over here and you increase this value by five, and you go over here and you increase this value by five. The same way you would do it for a block structure. Um, or in the case of a non-invertible operation, then I guess what you do is more like, is kind of more like this. Like if the operation is max, then let's say you update this value, then what you would do is you would co come over here and you would say, you would look at both of these values now, and you would use that to recompute the max here. And then you would come back up here, and you would look at this value. You don't go down the street, you just look at this value, and this value, and you use it to recompute this value. That's kind of the more general way to do it. All right, so conceptually, like whenever we see this kind of problem where, you know, you want to know some property of the whole array, or some you know, query the property of some range of the array, but you have to support it, you have to support like real-time updates in the array, you think, okay, segment tree might be the right solution to this because a segment tree will be able to kind of keep the values sort of like well isolated from each other, right? That's the whole point. Uh, every value only affects a limited number of other values in the data structure. So conceptually, you think of a segment tree. So let's try it. Let's try to structure this as a segment tree. So first of all, okay, so like we'll have our base array. So um, what, like uh, the obvious thing to, like the obvious value to hold in the segment tree is like the current solution, right? Like, the, like what is the solution? Because that's the information we will need at the top of the tree, right? For like the summary of the whole array, that's what information we want to have. We want, like the, uh, the very top node of the segment tree is conceptually summarizing the whole array. 
So we want the solution there, obviously. Okay, so it seems like the, the value we want is the solution. Okay, so in that case, it kind of seems like we should populate our segment tree that way. Uh, so let's, let's do it. Um, okay, so here's our bottom array. It's going to have the same size as this original array. And okay, uh, so I guess we'll put these elements here. Um, and, oh, okay, and since every value of the segment tree is not holding the original value, it's holding the solution, then I guess that means that for, um, I guess that means for negative numbers, the solution to this like one individual segment is just zero, right? Whereas for positive numbers, it's just the number itself. Now, like where am I going with this? Like this is just, uh, if we say that what we expect the segment tree to hold is the solution to that segment of the problem, right, then that means that the leads are just holding the solution for like that one index, for that like range of the array that is that one index itself. So what is the solution for just this index? It is 10. What is the solution for just this index? Well, it's zero, right? Like if this is your input, then the best subarray is zero. You, you know, you don't, just don't take anything. Uh, so, for, so basically, initially, I guess it looks like for all the negative numbers, we should put zero here. And for all the positive numbers, we should put, uh, you know, just the number itself, because you will just take the number itself. Um, now, already you can kind of see a problem here. So first of all, like, we seem to have lost a bunch of information here, right? Like, the answer can't be independent of how big these negative values are. But already we've lost this information, right? Like, uh, I mean, we can keep the original array, sure, but it kind of seems like this can't be going in the right direction if, uh, you know, we don't even have this information in the segment tree of, like, how negative these values are. In any negative number would get converted to a zero here. Uh, so that's troubling, but here's kind of, like, where you really run into, like, big problems. It's like, so supposedly, I'm supposed to kind of, like, combine this value and this value, and I'm supposed to combine this value and this value, uh, and so on, right? Well, for sake of argument. Um, by the way, what do you do when it's not a power of two? Uh, well, you can just create one for itself. Uh, in some cases, you can even exclude it from the summary, uh, but sometimes, like in this problem, you cannot, because in this problem, we hope to build a top level that has the summary of everything, right? In other problems, like for example, in some problem, we could have actually not included any summary for this, because we always went from the bottom up. So we kind of don't need any summary of this. Uh, but kind of more general is just you, 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 know, you just include you know, uh, a parent node with just this one child, essentially. Uh, so, okay, I mean, I can get the answer here, but I don't know how to combine like, any of these. I mean, and to make matters worse, to kind of illustrate this, like let's say we did have another element here. So then this would be seven and 10. Like for sure, I have no idea how to combine seven and 10. Uh, or, you know, make it 10 and 10 to just uh, make it easier. Uh, to prove to you that I have no idea how to combine it, let me illustrate this. There can be two different cases. In both cases, the answer here, well, maybe not at the least, but like at a higher level. Like if I have, to, if I have a left array that the value for it is 10, and I have a right array for which the value is 10, the final answer could be different depending on what those arrays actually were. And that's the problem. Like, so in other words, I cannot compute the, the, net, the value, the combined value from just knowing the children values. It's not enough information. Because information has been lost in this value. Uh, to, sh to show you that th this is the case, suppose you have a node somewhere in your tree where like, the left array looks like this. Right? And so, of course, you've pre-stored that the answer to this is 10. Like, because the best subarray here is 10. Um, and somewhere, and, and you know, the, to the right of that, you have this array. Right? And so, of course, here the answer is 10. So, in this case, what is the combined value? The combined value is 20. Looking at these arrays, you can see that the best combined subarray for the left half and the right half would be to take you know, this range, take 10 and 10, and add them together. But what if the, the, what if the, the reason the answer is 10 matters, right? Because like, what if instead of having this structure, uh, the situation was that on the left, we have something like this. 
And that's why the answer is 10. And then on the right, on the right piece, we, we have, you know, we had some subarray like this, and that's why we get an answer of 10. So in both of these cases, like, in, in both of these cases, somewhat, like, even if we manage to build the tree up to this point, we will have some node of the tree where, like, the, where the, the left child is 10, and the right child is 10, and, you know, these have some further children, and so on. Uh, th this 10 is the summary value for this subarray, this 10 is the summary value for this subarray, but we can't distinguish between these two cases, right? So in this case, the best overall answer is 10, because we can take either this one or this one, we can never combine them. We can never get 20. But if it was the other way around, and if the 10s were facing each other, then the overall best answer is 20. So in other words, the problem is that the, not, the value we're trying to get is not a function of its two children. It's a function of like other factors that we need to know about in addition to uh, you know, the value of the left and the value of the right. Can you store all the indexes of the best subway inside that array? Say, in this case, it would be just index 2, and in this case, index 1. And when we combine them, we see if we adjust them, then we can uh, add them. If we add the non adjustment, then you basically need to choose the maximum volume. So you you, have, you actually have the right idea. Uh, now I'm not I'm actually not I actually don't think that what you're proposing would still be enough information to solve the problem. Yeah, I think you would still run into the same issue uh, if I correctly understand what you're proposing. But you have like totally the right idea here, which is that we need to store additional information. And how much additional information do we need to store? Well, we basically need it to be the case that the that the value of the parent node, the value of the next level of the segment tree, can be, in fact be computed from its children. Like we have to store enough information for that to be the case. Now, of course, we could just store the raw array, but that's bad, right? Because if we store the raw array, then this step is potentially really expensive. And in fact, let's consider how this is solved. Forget the dynamic update problem for a second. Let's consider the problem, uh, the original problem, like you just do it on a static array. But let's say we want to solve this using divide and conquer. And now we will see kind of like what the parallels are between divide and conquer and segment trees. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, so let's say you want to solve it using divide and conquer. Here's like a simple divide and conquer approach. Split the array in two, right? Split the array into a left half and a right half. Compute the answer independently for the left half and the right half. So get some left answer. Get some right answer. And then there's basically two possibilities. Either the answer is, or three possibilities. Either the, the, best, the best subarray is entirely on the left, or it's entirely on the right, or it's some combination of the two and passes through the middle. Right? That's the divide and conquer algorithm here. Either the answer is entirely on the left, entirely on the right, or passes through the middle. So the equation will be basically answer, like overall answer, overall answer equals left, oh, is basically the better of three things. Uh, max, left dot answer, right dot answer, and some combination. So, so far, this formula is great. Like, we want a formula like this, right? Because with this formula, like, if it was just this, it's not just this, right? But if it was just this, then given the left and right answer, we can efficiently compute the overall answer. And that's the property we want. We want the, whatever we're computing to be a function of the, like, in answers on the left and the right. But right now, it's not. Because here, in the divide and conquer algorithm, there's a third component, right? Um, and what is the third component? The third component is kind of like why the divide and conquer algorithm is kind of slow. The third component is you have to consider stuff passing through the middle. So how do you consider it? Well, you basically go and you calculate the best suffix of this array. Like, you know, for, for an answer to pass through the middle, it has to be some suffix of this, right? Like some suffix of this and some prefix of this. So it is basically, it is basically left dot 
So I will call, you know, by answer I will mean like the overall best. So I will, I will kind of write it like this. The overall best is the maximum of the best of the left. So try just, going, just getting the best answer from the left. Try getting just the best answer from the right. And then, uh, and then on the left, we will, we will say it like this. Um, get, get the best suffix. Uh, we'll call it, yeah, we'll, we'll call it like uh, max suffix. Yeah, we'll call it le left dot max suffix plus right dot max prefix. So we need this additional information in the divide and conquer algorithm to make the divide and conquer algorithm work, right? If, if we're solving this by divide and conquer, um, like forget segment trees for a moment, but just try to solve the problem using divide and conquer. Uh, you'll see why we want to solve the problem using divide and conquer in a second, if you don't already kind of see the natural connection here. Uh, but the, it's because the, like see, we're saying the overall best solution is the maximum of the best solution on the left, the best solution on the right, and if you take the maximum suffix of the left array and add that to the maximum prefix of the right array, that is the best solution that passes through the middle. And then the overall solution has to be one of those three cases. So you take whichever one of those three cases is the best one, and you get the answer. Right? Okay. So that is, um, now how do you make this work though? Because here, the recursion is only going to be returning you the best solution. Best, best. Uh, so, uh, so the divide and conquer algorithm ha adds this extra slow step, which is they will naively scan from here to find, you know, in linear time, you will kind of, you, you will not get the information from the recursion. Instead, you will go back to the original input to scan from the middle and scan until you find the best suffix and then you will scan the other way and find the best prefix, and then you will add them together. And the running time of that will be linear. And so overall, the like, equation of the running time will be like this. You will get this analysis that the time it takes for n elements <coughs> is you have to solve two subcases of size n over 2, and then you have to do this linear time step, right? And this is the same analysis as merge sort. Merge sort has the same equation. So this is uh, n log n. Uh huh. What is what do we mean by the max suffix and the max prefix? Um, so the left the left side's maximum suffix is basically the largest the highest sum suffix that you can get that is a suffix of the left. So like in other words, like the left array here is ten negative five six thirteen. So the maximum uh, suffix here is, you know, you can consider 13, you can consider 13 minus 6, you can consider 13 minus 6 minus 5, and you can consider 13 minus 6 minus 5 plus 10. So the maximum suffix is actually 13 here. Like the candidates are all the things that, are, that end at the end of the left array. Basically it's saying out of all the things that end at the left, uh, or at the right boundary, uh, out of all the subarrays that, out of all the contiguous subarrays that like end at the at the boundary, what is the maximum? What is the maximum sum? <laughs> but do we need to include the first element in the left dot max suffix? I think we should exclude that element because that's a suffix. Otherwise, it will be same as left dot max. Um, I'm not sure I follow. So the left dot best is basically ten to thirty uh, in this case. Uh, the left, it's like zero to third. I mean, in this case, left dot best is actually thirteen. Oh yeah. Because on the left side, the best solution is yeah, just. Yeah, but the range is zero to three, right? Uh, but when we say left dot max suffix, uh, we shouldn't include zero. We should say one to three, right? Um, we can include the same as left dot best, right? Oh yeah, but it can be the same as left dot best. That's allowed. There's no problem with that. Uh, basically, okay, basically, we're, like, we're just splitting it into three cases. We're saying, consider a solution that happens only on the left, consider a solution that happens only on the right, and consider a solution that combines, that combines both sides, in which case uh, the solution from the left side has to, be, has to end at the boundary, and the solution on the right side has to begin at the boundary, and then they can be optimized independently by kind of like a copy and paste argument 
If, like for example, if you took some good solution on the left and you combined it with not the best solution on the right, you can just replace it with a different solution on the right and get a better value. Uh, yeah. So why do you need all of that and not just uh, because you don't have? Suppose you also keep the track on the sum of the second uh, sorry the partition. That you know. So there's only two for that for the max suffix. It's either the, the so sum no one is saying that like you cannot optimize this. Right? Like, like, we're just saying, like, with what we have now, this is the running time. Okay. If you don't have extra data, right? Okay. Yeah, like, like, no, there's like, well, I'm just saying with what we have now, like, of course we can op optimize this algorithm further, or otherwise I wouldn't, you know, go on for this problem about 30 minutes and we would be done. Uh, but, uh, yes, like, we can optimize this further, but with what we have, we, we have to do this, like, order and running time because we have to, like the, the the best the maximum suffix may be a lot smaller than the like the maximum value overall. So we, we have to you know check all the suffixes basically. But suppose I had suppose that on the left side, for example, uh -huh. I already split up into two and two, right? So yeah. I may have the max suffix on the left, and then mm -hmm. I just have to compare this that sum uh, of the all the elements of that plus the maximum suffix of that in order for me to compute the maximum suffix at the four level, right? Right. So take the max suffix here plus whatever sum is in here. That's the wow. possibility, or just the maximum suffix here. Compare those two, and I know what the maximum suffix is. I don't have to like go one by one if, I, if, if I'm just looking for the maximum. Right. Um, with, well, with no additional information, you do. Uh, but like maybe you're like, like I'm not I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not sure I get your point. Like it might be just a, it might just be that you're like already anticipating the next thing we're going to do. Uh, with with like no additional information, like no, like just looking at this, you, like there is no way you can know what is the like best left dot suffix except by scanning. Like if you have no additional information, uh, you might you're probably just anticipating like the next thing we're going to do. Um, so basically, uh, like no, normally the way to structure the uh, the divide and conquer algorithm, like the simplest formulation is this. Like basically, each recursive branch returns back the best solution, um, and then you have to you have to like compute the max suffix and the max prefix on the fly by going back to the original data, um, and then this is a, like a slow step, and you basically get n log n for the algorithm. Okay, um, but here's the thing, here's the thing, right? So um, so th so this is like a divide and conquer approach. Now. Let's say uh, we want to. Let's say we want to implement this with with the segment tree, right? So we're going to kind of have a problem here, right? Like we once again cannot combine, cannot. Uh, we we uh, for for the segment tree, we see that we have like basically similar logic, like just like in the divide and conquer approach where you're trying to take the solution on the left side and solution on the right side and get the overall best solution. Uh, the segment tree kind of has the same problem, right? You, you're basically trying to get like the left child and the right child and combine that into the best solution overall. But uh, the segment tree can't, basically can't afford to do this because this is a linear step. If you're going to solve the problem in linear time, why not just solve it using that first like initial method that everybody learns for their interviews, right? Like we can't afford this step. We can't afford to calculate max suffix and max prefix. So what do we do? Well, the idea is, well, what if we didn't have to calculate it because it was also passed up to us from our children? Like, what if instead of like each child having only the overall solution, each child also contains its max suffix and max prefix so the information can be passed up to the next layer? Uh, so, like, what if we also kind of include in the equation uh, so, so in other words, like instead of, for example, having in our segment tree a child that has the value 10 and a child that has the value 10, and then when we try to combine them, we are stuck, right? Because we have this value, we have this value, but we don't have these values, and if we went back to the original input to compute it, it would take us linear time, and that would defeat the whole purpose of the segment tree in the first place, because we were trying to beat linear time for updates, right? So instead of being stuck here, what if this information is actually contained in the children like I've kind of suggested with this dot notation? Like what if the structure that we store here isn't just a single value? Because we can operate on any type as long as it's, 
you know, as long as combining two things of that type produces another thing of the same type. Uh, so how about a child is actually now a structure that contains several values. So a child contains the best value, so for example here 10, but we will also say what a child's, like we will for example say that a child's max suffix is 6, uh, and a child's, you know, max prefix is 2, for example, right? Uh, so what if, what if we now have that information? So basically for every node, we are actually storing the information about the best value, the max suffix, and the max prefix. Then we can apply this formula, right? Um, except we still have a problem, uh, which is that in order to apply the formula, we have to make sure that here we are not just computing the best value, here we also better be able to compute the max suffix and the max prefix, right? Because this value may in turn have to be combined at a higher level. So this, the, you know, and the calculation in the parent may itself be a child somewhere up in the tree. So we have to make sure that essentially if we say that our structure contains the max suffix and the max prefix, we better be able to compute that at the parent level too. So let's try it. So now we have overall that dot max, ma uh, yeah, I'll just shorten it with max x, ma max s, max suffix. Um, so uh, what is the overall max suffix of an array? And, and keep in mind, we don't want to like, do any expensive computation. We want to make it cheap. Uh, we want to basically reuse the values coming from the children. We don't want to have to go back to the original input and like scan through stuff. We want to find a way to define this that is defined purely in terms of the values coming from the children. So, so, because then we'll be able to do it quickly if we don't have to look at the original input again. Uh, so how can we do it? Well, what is the max suffix of like, for example, this array? And knowing that I already evaluated it on this like left side and on this right side. Well, the max suffix of this array, there's two options. Either it is the max suffix of just the right part, like if the if the entire uh, if the entire suffix is is limited to the right part, then it's the same as the max suffix of the right piece. Or it could stretch out to the left part, in which it it includes the entire sum of the right array plus the max suffix of the left piece. So in other words, it's the better of two things. I have to consider, if I want the max suffix overall, I have to take, I have to take the right max suffix. And I also have to consider the, taking the entire sum of the right. If it, if it extends out to the left, I take the entire sum of the right, and then I add in the best suffix I can get on the left. So left max suffix. Yeah, and then and then of course I have to give a, I have to give uh, you know an answer for the like max prefix too. So this is max, uh, the, and the prefix is just like a mirror operation. So either you take the the left's max prefix or you take the sum of the left and then add the right's max prefix. And finally, we're still not done because now, like to write these two equations, we brought yet another thing into the mix, right? We brought in the sum, which is still not defined, but fortunately, this is where it ends because, uh, like, uh, we, it ends here because overall sum is just left sum plus right sum. So now we've actually been able to define a type that is really a function of the of two piece of like two pieces of it. We've managed to break, to break down the problem into a way, in a way, where the answer to a problem will really be a function of just the answers to the left side of the problem combined with the answers to the right side of the problem. This should be common instead of a class. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, well, here I use this like 
I use the shorthand of calling it ms. Uh, so left dot max suffix plus right dot max prefix. There we go. Yeah, so this is what it is. So now finally we have a data type that can be combined just by looking at the data type itself with no reference to the original output. So this is really good news now. Now we can, we can say that like, you know, if we have these four pieces of information for the left side and for the right side, what is the max suffix, max prefix, overall best in case that is neither a suffix or prefix, and uh, the overall sum in case it has to be used in the suffix calcul or prefix calculations, if we have those four pieces of information, we can get those same four pieces of information. This is the important part. We get the same four pieces of information uh, for the overall solution. So this is, uh, th th this is good stuff. And so before we even take it to the segment trees, we can observe that with this approach, we can actually even improve the running time of just the, the divide and conquer algorithm for just static computation. Like e even if we didn't have this problem of elements updating, uh, okay, so just like for the divide and conquer approach, here's what we'll do. We, we will use this approach instead, and now look at what the time complexity analysis is. So to solve the problem for n elements, you have to solve the problem on each half but now the combination step is order one rather than order n, because you make no reference to the original data to combine the left side and the right side. And now this is really nice, because now the, now the analysis of this is the same as, for example, traversing a binary search tree. This is the same equation. Uh, and you will get the, the overall solution is that time of n is order n. And so, so again, this is not the time complexity we wanted for segment trees, right? But for solving the overall problem, this is good. This is as good as the other, like the, naive, the typical solution you see for this problem. More complicated, but we, using a divide and conquer method, we got to the same answer of like order n. So this quick uh, mm -hmm. So the first statement, overall best is at this level, and then the other three computations are for sending to the serial. Well, no, it's more like the parent evaluates the, the, these same attributes, like the parent call, like the, the function returns a structure that has these four things. You write a function that like takes a subrange of the array to operate on and returns these four things. Like when you get back the four, th the four things from your left child, and like from your one branch of the recursion for the left subarray, left subproblem, and you get back these four things from the right side of the subproblem, you combine them using this formula and you return that up to the next level. Okay. Like, it's just like a divide and conquer, but like, think of it like for like, uh, for like, let's say you wanted to solve, uh, sum up the entire array as a divide and conquer problem. That's like a dumb thing seemingly to do, but okay, how would you do it? You would say, return the sum of the left subarray and return the sum of the right subarray, right? And then, and, and then the, now return their combined sum. This is the same thing, but for this much more complicated thing. Like, we're kind of uh, figuring out what we actually need to return in order to be able to define the answer for overall, just in terms of the answer for the left and the right side. Uh, so why do we want to do this? Like, okay, so by itself, like, th it seems like this divide and conquer approach to this problem has no value, because after all, we had this, like, we had this, like, linear time algorithm that was really simple before, right? Why, why bother with this? Well, consider the task of um, either, either dynamic updates, that's what the segment tree is for, or the task of parallelism, which is like you want to parallelize the algorithm. So to understand parallelism, let's go back to kind of a simpler example, the task of summing up all the entries in an array, right? Divide and conquer actually makes a lot of sense for that because you assign the left side to one thread and you assign the right side to another thread working in parallel. So now you, you, you so basically to really parallelize a problem, you see that to like give a parallel algorithm, you, you need to use a divide and conquer approach. Because if you use an approach where every value depends on every other value, that will kind of just block the different parallel workers, right? Like a, a parallel worker number two will need the information from parallel worker number one and will not be able to proceed. But when you define a problem in terms of divide and conquer, 
that's when you can paralyze it, because the left half and the right half can be worked on independently. So, you know, we could imagine this kind of algorithm for summing up an array. You want to sum up an array like this, split it in half, assign this half to one worker, assign this half to the other workers, and the workers can further delegate. Like, basically, the left, the left worker receives this half of the array, and it says, okay, I want to sum, up, sum it up, so I'm going to, you know, again, divide it into two and assign each half to a separate thread. And you keep splitting it like that until you know you have no more processors or you know you don't want to the, the input is too small and the overhead of spinning up another thread is not worth it. So in a way, when a uh, problem is defined using this kind of like uh, shall we say like divide and con yeah like when basically we give a divide and conquer answer to a problem, we can then also give a parallel algorithm. Now one thing we'll note is that the like parallel algorithm that's going to be the most efficient is the one that doesn't have like these nasty kind of like additional linear time steps. So let's say we want to parallelize the solution to this problem, right? We want to we want to uh, give a parallel algorithm solution to, to, to this problem of you know finding the maximum maximum sum subarray. We Get, so, so we basically give, give uh, one thread the task of computing the left stuff, and we give another thread the task of computing the stuff on the right. But then there's, the, like in our original version of the algorithm, the one where we had this like third case to consider where we had to scan from each side, right? S just merely combining the answers from those two workers, even if those two workers are really fast because they're like highly parallel, uh, combining the answer would have itself been kind of like this slow sequential step. So for a parallel algorithm, we actually want something like this. We want something where the answer depends only on a small amount of data returned from each worker, where we don't have to look at the original input to get the answer. Because, because now we could have this incredibly efficient parallel algorithm to compute this. Uh, basically dispatch this to, the, to one thread, dispatch this to another thread, and then each of those threads can in turn fork off other threads and further split the input. Um, and actually, what is the analysis of this parallel algorithm? Like, how, how long will it take to run? Well, we can kind of say it this way. So the time taken for n elements is we will basically need to spin up two threads, but assume that's like a constant time operation. So we will spend a constant time initializing two threads. And then, we, and then the two threads will work in parallel to solve the left problem and the right problem. So that means their co time complexity is only counted once. Instead of counting two, and like instead of counting it like this, like we would have counted it in the standard uh, non-parallel algorithm, these two things happen at the same time. So, th so now the time, is, time of, for n is just order one plus time for n over two, plus you have to combine the answers. And here's where the efficiency of this is really critical. Because if we still have like a linear step here, if this was still a sequential order n step, the problem is that then the analysis of this, the, the, then this equation would just become time of n is, is order n plus time of n over 2. So expanding that out, you would get like n plus n over 2 plus n over 4 plus n over 8, which would be like still linear. And so you, wouldn't, you basically have not succeeded in parallelizing the algorithm because you wouldn't have beaten the sequential order n algorithm. But now, we can reduce this to order one. And now this is really beautiful because this is the same analysis as binary search. Right, binary search has the same equation. That time of n is time of n over two plus order one. And so actually, here, the uh, overall time that this takes is just a log n. Now, you might find it hard to believe uh, because like, how can it be that fast? But the thing is, that this is like making kind of an assumption of infinite processors. Like infinite, only, only limited by your ability to spin up the threads fast enough. Uh, and like no memory bottlenecks, nothing. So of course this won't really work. In practice what will happen is, even assuming no memory bottlenecks or anything like that, you, what will happen is, you know, you'll, it only makes sense to do this up to the number of processors you have, and then at that point you kind of stop. Uh, and you, you, know, you just get a reduction that is proportional to how many processors you have. But in a kind of a model where you ha your number of processors is virtually unlimited, you would actually get log n performance here. Okay, 
So what does this have anything to do with segment trees, and why is this part of the same unit? Well, you might have realized that this efficient combination operation that is critical to taking a divide and conquer algorithm and making it amenable to parallelization, having a way to combine the inputs of the left and right piece uh, in such a way that you don't have to make reference to the original data and you don't have any slow steps, is exactly what a segment tree needs as well. So when you have a segment tree, um, th this kind of efficient combination operation is exactly what you want because if you have that linear slow step, then that defeats the whole purpose of the segment tree because you might as well just recompute the answer from scratch. So the whole point of a segment tree is to derive the answer from the left side and the right side without any intermediate slow steps and that's exactly what parallelization needs too. So how will this look like now in, uh, in, in a segment tree? Well, first you will basically define the leaves and each leaf will basically be like, you know, you will have, if there was eight pieces of input here, you know, there will be eight here. And in each one, you'll record each of these four attributes. Like, you'll record like a best, MS, MP, etc. Like, you'll record these four attributes in each of these cells. So basically, think that like, the array has like four slots, one for each value, or there's maybe four separate arrays or whatever. Um, and then, you will build the segment tree by just kind of like, you know, uh, you, you, well, you build the next level of the segment tree, like each block summarizes the previous two. So your structure looks, you know, kind of like this. So this is an array of size eight, this is an array of size four, this is an array of size two, this is an array of size one, and each one has all of these attributes. Like it ha it's basically each slot holds a four tuple. It, it holds a four tuple of these attributes, best, maximum suffix, maximum prefix, and sum. It, it holds like a four tuple of each of these attributes. Now, what happens when a value gets updated? When a value gets updated, you calculate its value for each of these four attributes, and you put them down here. And then you just propagate that change up. So for example, let's say you updated whatever value you had here. Then you would, you would propagate up to here, and this one would look at the updated value here plus the old value from here to calculate a new answer here. And you would update this too. And then here you would again update this based on the old value over here and on the value here. And then uh, and finally you would update the overall answer. So when you update something, it's like, it's like we saw in the sum problem where uh, you know, we, when you updated a you know, when you updated a number, you had to like propagate the changes in that number up the tree. The same thing will happen here. Um, you, you basically, you'll go up the levels and each level at the subtree will look at the value that just got updated plus the other value it's responsible for that didn't get updated. And it will apply this formula, which is a constant time formula, to recalculate the new value of this cell. And then that will, and then it will transfer control up to the next one. And again, this will be recalculated for these two. You'll get an updated answer here. And then you, you'll look here and here to get an updated answer here. And then the answer at the top is actually your overall solution, right? The answer at the top contains the best max suffix, max prefix sum for the overall array. Which means that, uh, you know, th this overall the best of the top cell is the answer you're looking for. So um, basically, uh, you can see now that the information you have to store in each cell of a segment tree is more or less uh, the same that you would want to compute in every branch of the recursion for a parallel algorithm. Uh, and it's also what you want for a divide and conquer algorithm, and these are all related. In fact, a segment tree, like basically the way you can view a segment tree, and this is like a very like fundamental, important, view of this topic, in my opinion, is that think of a segment tree as basically being you ran the divide and conquer algorithm and you just recorded what was returned in each step. So think of it like building the initial segment tree is akin to solving the problem with divide and conquer and just recording the value returned back in each branch. So the value, when you first build the segment tree, the value at the top will be the, the overall solution. Um, like in that starting state for which you pre-processed and built the segment tree. The value at the top will be like the overall solution for the entire array. 
Uh, so it will basically how would you how are, how are you going to compute that initially? Well, compute it via a divide and conquer algorithm. Say that like okay, you're going to find the value for the left side and find the value for the right side and then combine it. But then as you find those values, just leave it recorded in the, in the area laid out for it. So basically, it's as if you ran a divide and conquer algorithm and every time you return something, you kind of stored what it was before you returned it. Uh, it's, it's just like, mem like through memory recording what happened at each step of the divide and conquer. And this comes in useful because then when you update one thing, you don't have to repeat the whole computation. You use this, this fact, like, so you update this cell, like you, you updated this. Now you don't have to repeat this part of the computation. You need to recompute this piece because this piece, uh, like originally in the original divide and conquer, this piece called this piece and you need to repeat the computation now. Uh, so you recompute this but using this old value here. And then when, when you need to recompute this piece, you don't have to like do all the recursion needed to get this answer again. You just use the old answer that you had. So it's as if you were doing divide and conquer and you just saved all the answers. And then when you need to, cha to, when you need to change one of the inputs to it, you just change it in one place and you propagate the differences up and you get the new constructed solution. So this is like a, I, I mean, I think this is like a really important view of segment trees to kind of understand it in this way. That essentially, like what does a segment tree do? At the like highest level, it's splitting the full array. It has a node that covers the full array and has like the aggregated answer for the full array. And it's splitting it into a left side of the array and a right side of the array. And that's exactly what a divide and conquer algorithm would do. Um, and like, like I mentioned, when you write a divide and conquer algorithm, sometimes some divide and conquer algorithms will have these like slow steps in them where not all of the information is really retained. It's kind of like, you know, maybe you calculate the answer on the left side and you calculate the answer on the right side and you do some more work by looking at the original input. But for segment trees, that's bad and you, ha and you have to find a representation that with passing just a small amount of data at each level, you can kind of avoid looking at the original input and you can just uh, calculate the answer just based on the information returned from your children. And coincidentally, that's also what you need to keep your parallel algorithms efficient because that way you will have no slow sequential steps that can't be split between different threads. This uh, structure will support, uh -huh. this structure that we discussed will support between I and J I can get, right? Give me the maximum. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so we define this problem. We define this problem as saying just like give me the overall answer at any time. But we could actually even like extend the problem and we could ask you to uh, you know also even be able to return what is the best answer of the subarray from A to J. And then you would have to select the appropriate segments. Like for example, if the query if I have a query covering uh, like this range, if I have a query if I want my query to cover, say, like this range, what I would do is I would get the answer from here, and then I would, you know, follow that segment tree algorithm I showed from before, where I would promote to this range, and then I would get the answer from here. So, if I had to, for example, find the maximum sub subarray in just this range, I would get this piece, and I would get this piece, and then I would combine them using the formula, like the way we did for the sum. It's basically the same logic as we did for the sum, like you just abstract the plus function with a function that takes your structure and combines and produces an answer. Like, you know, in, like somewhere in the implementation there will be a step that will be like, uh, in the sum implementation there would have been a step that will be like, uh, you know, current sum equals sum one plus sum two or whatever, and here you will just have like combining function argument one, argument two. Uh, it's kind of the same. It's just you're not operating on numbers that are added, you're operating on this data type of four things that are combined by this formula. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we're getting parallel for the implementation. Uh, it's like, it looks like it's twiggle and uh, it's, it's nice, 
But practically, if you take a look at the constants, how, how costly is the preparation? And it might be that uh, you need to really have a very huge way to make it happen. Because it looks like one uh, prior to spawn is like equal to several thousand additions. Then it makes that the array have to be a two power thousand uh, to be. Uh, right. So, like in practical terms, uh, what will generally happen is people will say, okay, if the array has now been reduced to, like if the subproblem is now only a thousand elements or less, you know, don't, don't like split it into any more threads. Yeah. Like that's kind of what would happen, I guess. Well, like I don't want to say like what it should be, I guess it depends on like the characteristics. But, but yeah, like obviously like not every operation has the same cost. And so... Yeah, and so it's not going to be like exactly split until you only have one element in your range. You might stop splitting into threads once you have a thousand elements to sum, or ten thousand, or whatever. Okay. So this is uh, so kind of to recap. Here we saw like a more kind of advanced usage of the segment tree, where conceptually we're sort of doing the same thing. We're just we're we're just updating uh, global total. Uh, based on the information for each, uh, you know, each sub piece, uh, but it's it's much more complicated here just because we have these like le like we have a, it's it's not simple addition. Uh, instead, we had to keep the information for each piece, um, and we had to combine that to we had to find this combining formula to efficiently combine it and propagate the result up the tree. So basically, when you start the algorithm, you will uh, you, you will conceptually like you know you can e do it either bottom up or top down. You can either solve the problem using divide and conquer and just record in each cell the information you found along the way, or you could do it bottom up, where basically you populate each bottom up cell uh, with the information initially, and then you kind of propagate it up and and compute all the answers up to the top. And then you have your initial segment tree. Then when you get an update operation, you update like the one cell at the bottom related to the update operation and propagate the changes up the tree uh, as appropriate. And every time you can see that when you do an update, you will have to propagate logarithmically many levels up the tree. And each of those updates will be constant. So it will be like log n update. Um, and to get the maximum at any given time, you will just look at the root to get it from there. So it'll actually be constant just to get the information. So you will have like order one get and order log n update. And if you wanted to query a subrange, like find out what is the maximum uh, subarray sum between like two certain indices, then you would have to do like the kind of log time query we discussed earlier with the with the summing problem. If we get new data, so the n changes, it will just get added as a, as a leaf node. Yeah, so um, kind of interesting uh, question. Like, so so far, like this whole segment tree discussion has centered on what do you like? You know, we've assumed the sum is the, the like number of elements, uh, the total size of the input is constant, right? So, how, how do you deal with a situation where uh, you can actually have like insertions? Well, so basically, you have to use like a tree rather, like a true tree rather than an array, because you'll recognize that it, there's no efficient way to ever insert an element into an array. So instead, you have to have a tree. So uh, conceptually, think of it like um, a segment tree. You can already conceptually think of it uh, this way, right? Like, like so, right? Conceptually, you already think of it this way. Um, but now, uh, if a node has to be inserted at a position, like let's say a node has to be inserted here, well, you have to do some kind of like, you know, whatever. Uh, either like tree rotation operations, if you're using like something like an ADL tree, or you can do this idea of like what are called uh, two, three, four trees, where s trees are allowed to have up to four children, but if they have more than that, then they get split. So for example, if a node has to be inserted here, it'll just be added like this, and this, this node will now summarize three different things. Um, and you know, if you have to add another node, you'll just do it like this, and if you have to add a fifth node, then at this point you would uh, split this node into two um, and do it like this and now you have to um, now this node has to be responsible for three nodes 
So there's, there's you know, different ideas for how, how you can do it with trees. It's all based on just like general tree concepts. Uh, you know, you either do it with like a, you know, you can do it with something like a red-black tree, you can do it with something like a AVL tree, you can do it with something like these like two, three, four trees. Uh, just, it has to be some kind of tree-based concept because otherwise insertion at a particular position will never be efficient. So just, uh, just mm -hmm. uh, was curious, if we have new data coming in, can we assume that it will always come at the end? Or what would be the case where we have something like inserted in the middle? I don't want to say. I mean, uh, but like, you know, maybe you have, you have to support insert at arbitrary position or something like that. You need a data structure that supports like insert a new value at this particular position. If you don't need that, if stuff is, if values are being added but only at the end, you can actually come up with kind of like a much simpler concept where it's structured almost the same way. Like think of it this way: like you will basically just in, instead of having instead of having log n different arrays, you will have log n different array lists. Like you will have like log n like you know rowable arrays, and you will just row the arrays as necessary. If you add two more elements to your uh, base array, then you will add one more element to your to your summary array, and you will just kind of grow it as necessary. 